really appreciate that. Well, we are uh, coming to a time now where we're going to open the Bible together. So if you'll stand at this time, we're going to say our Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible together tonight. So if you'll hold your Bibles high to the sky this evening. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. You may be seated at this time, and if you'll open your Bibles this evening in two different places. Uh, first of all, the book of Matthew, chapter number one, and second of all, to the book of Luke, chapter number three. Matthew, chapter number one, and Luke, chapter number three. That's where we're going to find ourselves this evening, and immediately upon turning to Matthew, chapter number one, what you're going to find is a long, long list of names. And I'm going to read these names to you tonight, and uh, you are going to think as I'm reading them, why in the world is the preacher reading all these names to us? Well, as we preach tonight's message here on Christmas, uh, this will all come uh, into a realization for you tonight, and I think you're going to be blessed by what the Lord uh, has laid on my heart this week. So let's begin reading in Matthew chapter 1. Verse number one. And just listen to some of these names because as you go through these names, what you're going to find in this genealogical record of Jesus are, are some names of Bible heroes, some names of Bible foes uh, in, in this genealogical record that might actually surprise you. So starting at verse one, the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered his rod. His rod fathered Aram. Aram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed, uh, Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered King David. Then David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. And Solomon fathered Rehoboam, and Rehoboam fathered Abijah, and Abijah fathered Asa. Asa fathered Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat fathered Joram, Joram fathered Uzziah, Uzziah fathered Jotham, Jotham fathered Ahaz, and Ahaz fathered Hezekiah, Hezekiah fathered Manasseh, Manasseh fathered Ammon, Ammon fathered Josiah, and Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Then after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Shealtiel, Shealtiel fathered Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel fathered Abiad, Abiad fathered Eliakim, Eliakim fathered Azor, Azor fathered Zadok, Zadok fathered Achim, Achim Philip fathered Eliad, Eliad fathered Eleazar, Eleazar fathered Mathan, Mathan, uh, Mathan fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who was called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. From David until the exile to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the exile to Babylon until the Messiah, 14 generations. So now if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. It was a lot of names, wasn't it? Yeah. Tongue twisters. <laughs> Luke chapter 3, verse 23. As he began his ministry... Jesus was about 30 years old and was thought to be, uh, the rendering there in your Bible could say, and was thought to be or was supposed to be the son of Joseph. Understand what the Bible is saying here. Actually, uh, it's historical record that Joseph went to the temple of Jerusalem and actually legally adopted Jesus as his son. And so Jesus, Joseph at least, knew that Jesus was not his biological son. And so Joseph knew that Jesus come from somewhere else. He was either born of the Holy Ghost or he was born of another man. But he actually legally adopted Jesus. And so he is thought to be or the supposed son of Joseph. Son of Heli, son of Mathat, son of Levi, son of Melchi, son of Janai, son of Joseph, son of Mathathias, son of Amos, son of Nahum, son of Esli, son of Nagai, son of Maath, son of Matthias, son of Simeon, son of Josic, son of Jodah, son of Joanan, son of Rasha, son of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, son of Neri, son of Melchi, son of Adi, son of Kosum, son of 
Elmadam, son of Ur, son of Joshua, son of Eleazar, son of Joram, son of Mathat, son of Levi, son of Simeon, son of Judah, son of Joseph, son of Jonan, son of Eliakim, son of Malaya, son of Mena, son of Mathatha. And now listen to this. Now there's going to be a, a kind of a break here in, in the lineage of Jesus. Well, it's kind of been a break the whole time. But here's the tipping point. Son of Nathan, son of David, son of Jesse, son of Obed, son of Boaz, son of Salmon, son of Nashon, son of Amenadab, son of Ram, son of Hezron, son of Perez, son of Judah, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham. Now watch what Luke does. He keeps going past Abraham. Son of Terah, son of Nahor, son of Sarag, son of Reu, son of Peleg, son of Eber, son of Shelah, son of Canaan, or Kenan, son of Aparchad, son of Shem, son of Noah, son of Lamech, son of Methuselah, son of Enoch, son of Jared, son of Mahalalel, son of Kenan, son of Enos, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. Let's take a moment and pray, Father. As we look at these names tonight, God, we can be overwhelmed and we can even wonder how in the world do you get a Christmas message out of so many names. Not just a Christmas message, but how do you get any message out of so many names? But God, as I, as I came to this week and began to study and to pray, you continue to bring me back to this. And God, you confirmed this to me yesterday in just a little line from my own father as we're standing outside of my grandmother's house, and I said, Daddy, you know, being Christmas night, I just don't know how many people is going to show up. I said, it might just be a few of us. It might just be our family. And he said, well, then you might want to preach a message on the family. And God, that's exactly what we're doing as we're looking at the genealogical records of Jesus. We're just preaching on the family, the family of Jesus. So God, tonight I'm going to pray that somehow, some way, you might open our eyes to see the deeper truths of these, of these names. And then, God, it might lead us to a deeper understanding of who your son Jesus really is. And so, God, I give you the glory tonight, the praise and the honors. In the name of your son Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, I hope you've all had a good Christmas. Everybody had a good Christmas? Raise your hand if you have. Kids, I hope Santa Claus was good to you. I see one little kid, Kaylee, nod her head. Yeah, I know what she got. I saw the video on, on the Internet. She got a good gift. Uh, I hope you've all had some good gifts today, and and Brother Mac, I had I had some uh, some some good gifts given to me. Uh, probably the most meaningful gift that I received this year actually came from my son Tucker. Uh, Tucker, we gave him five dollars to take with him to school. They had a little Christmas store at school, Justin, to to buy uh, for the kids to buy your parents something. And uh, so so we gave Noah five dollars and Tucker five dollars, and Noah agreed to get his mama something, which he got her a little red ring uh, that she wears on her finger now, and Tucker used his $5 to get me something. And uh, he got me, uh, Russell, man, and make you proud, brother. He, he, he bought me a little mug that on the side of it says, uh, Super Dad, <laughs> right? And uh, man, that meant something to me. You know, Tucker, he loves superheroes. So to hear my son say, this is my daddy, and he's a super dad, man, that really just meant something to my heart. It's a meaningful gift. Probably the most useful gift that I received was from Summer. She got me a pair of new Adidas tennis shoes. And if anybody knows me, you know how much I love tennis shoes. And uh, to get a new pair and just fancy pair and just look good. And, and uh, kind of like Justin, he's always got on a new pair. And uh, so uh, I was just glad to get the tennis shoes and I know I'll walk them until there are holes in the bottom of them. But probably this year, the most thoughtful gift that I received is actually this little book uh, here, and it was actually written or composed or compiled uh, by my mama, uh, Jamie. And uh, on the front here, what you'll see on the cover, it says the Williams slash McDowell family. And uh, so this is the, the, the genealogical records of my grandfather, LJ, who comes every Sunday morning, and my grandmother, Roberta, who comes every Sunday morning. Uh, they've been married for 62 years, as a matter of fact. Isn't that a blessing? 62 years. And uh, so uh, this week, my mama gave me this little book, and I opened it up, and and uh, I, 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 was just, I just took some time the other day, Russell, to begin to kind of look through it. This thing goes all the way back to one of my, I guess, like three times great-grandfather, uh, Thomas Williams, uh, who was born in the year 1820. And this thing traces my family genealogy all the way up through the present day. And so I can go back, Russell, and I can see all of my cousins, and Brother Mac. You always make fun of how many cousins I have. 
And there's proof in here that I have that many cousins, man. There's a lot of cousins uh, in here. And uh, as a matter of fact, y'all probably don't know this, but Miss Fanny Williams, uh, who comes here, uh, she actually is a Costner uh, and her maiden name, and she's actually a cousin of mine too, somehow, some way. See, it's all, and see, I found out in Great Falls, everybody ties together some way, so it's only natural that I would tie in with somebody too. Uh, but but this, here, here's my point. This week, my mama gives me this gift, and, and, and Justin, I just sit down, man, and, uh, and I was studying the genealogical records, and so I kind of wanted to kind of get my mind into the heart of a Jewish person who would be reading these names. And so I begin to read these names, and as I go through these names, I begin to see names that I've heard before, and I begin to see little stories about them, and who they are, and, and where they come from, and who their children are. And as I begin to read these names, I spent hours just looking at this book, and looking at this name, and amazed at where I come from. Looking at my ancestors, looking at my great-grandfathers, and great-grandmothers, and aunts, and uncles, and all these people who come before me. And as I sat and read this book, guys, I want you to know that something funny happened in my heart. I began to cry just reading a list of names. Just reading names, I began to cry. Now, I suppose, Rick, tonight when this service is over, if I take this book, this same book, and I give it to you and I say, Rick, I want you to take this home and I want you to study my family history. I suppose you could go home and you could sit down and you could read this book. You could read every single name. But for some reason in my heart, I believe you would not cry. Why? It's not your family. It's not your family. And so these names in this book are not going to have the same effect on your heart as they have on my heart. They mean something to me. They're just a list of names to you. And I suppose that this is why oftentimes when we come to these genealogical records found in Scripture that we just kind of skim over, kind of just jump across them because they're just a list of names. They don't really mean anything to us. We don't know these people. They're not connected to us. And so why is it really important? Why is it there? And so we just kind of say, man, you know, it's just going to take me a long time to read all those names, so I'm just going to jump over it. This list of names is insignificant. But friends, I want you to know tonight that we couldn't be more off base. These genealogical records found in Scripture actually tell us a lot about the Jewish religion, but not only the Jewish religion, but they actually teach us of the true kingship and messiahship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to aim to just dig deeper into this genealogy. And I want us to see what it teaches us. And I believe by doing so, what you're going to find is this. By the time you leave out of here, you will understand two things. Number one, that Jesus is the rightful heir of King David. The rightful heir of King David who has every right to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. But secondly, what you're going to find through reading this tonight is not only is he the rightful heir of King David who has the right to sit on the throne in Jerusalem, more than that, he is the Son of God who has the right to sit on the throne of heaven. And so tonight I want us to look at this message, genealogy of the king. Genealogy of the king. And I know some of you already, you're thinking this is going to take forever. But friends, just listen, I believe this would bless your heart tonight. So three things tonight from this genealogy that we can gather. Number one, the genealogy of Jesus proves to us uh, or proves God's promises to the Jewish people. The genealogy of Jesus proved God's promises to the Jewish people. Now, as you look at the genealogy of Jesus here found in the book of Matthew, we're going to be jumping back and forth tonight. But as you look at the genealog genealogical record of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 1, two names jump off the page at you immediately. Those two names are found in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The two names that I'm pointing to are David and Abraham. What's it say here? Verse 1, chapter 1, the historical record of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Friends, there are probably no two individuals in the history of the Jewish faith in the history of the, of the nation of Israel, probably no two individuals have had as much of an impact on this group of people as these two names mentioned 
in verse number 1. Now, the only other two names that might come up in your mind that you could say kind of run close comparison to them would be Moses and Elijah. But not even Moses and Elijah received what God gave to Abraham and David. You see, God gave Abraham and David what the Bible calls covenant promises. Covenant promises. Now, friends, understand that in the Bible there is no promise, no agreement, strong than a covenant. A covenant is entered into by two individuals and a covenant cannot be broken. And so when God enters into a covenant with an individual, that covenant will stand for eternity. But that covenant will not stand for eternity because of the person that enters into it with God because we know, Donald, that we will sin, we will fail. So covenants aren't based on man who fall, who fail. Instead, the covenants are based solely on God and his faithfulness. And so when God enters into a covenant with Abraham or God enters into a covenant with David, you have to understand that that covenant will stand forever. And so the two covenants that are given first to Abraham is what we could call a racial covenant, a racial covenant. And so here's what God promised to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm going to build out of you a nation as numerous as the stars of the sky. From you and from your wife, Sarah, I'm going to bring offspring that the world cannot count. Now, this kind of seems like a funny covenant to enter into by God because of the fact that when he entered into the covenant, Abraham was already 75 years old, and Sarah was already 65 years old, well past the age of conception. Sarah was barren. She could not have a child. But God said, although this is what's taking place in your life, I want you to know this is for my glory. I'm entering into this covenant relationship with you, and you're going to have offspring. But not only does he promise them offspring or a race, he promises them a land. He says, not only am I going to give you children, I'm going to give you a place for them to live, a promised land. And so Abraham, leave everything you know and follow after me into this land that you've never seen. And so we know that Abraham and Sarah, they have to walk by faith. They leave everything behind in order to follow God and his promises because of this covenant that God had made with them to give them a child, which is what they've always wanted. But friends, we know what happens. Abraham and Sarah, they get to a point where, you know what, it just doesn't seem like God's going to do this. They're upwards in years. Now they're getting around their 90s and God still hasn't given them a child. And so Sarah says to Abraham, just go sleep with the old slave girl and She'll have a baby and we'll raise her as our own. And we know that Abraham and Sarah, they did this and it caused great grief. But God, because of his covenant blessing and his covenant promise, never broke the covenant with Abraham and Sarah, although they went into sin. And finally, what does God do? God gives them the promised son, Isaac. Now, Isaac to the Jewish people it is more than just the promised son to Abraham and Sarah. You see, for the Jewish people, Isaac is what we know as a forerunner of the Messiah. So from Isaac and from Abraham, we will get the Jewish Messiah. And so when we look at verse number two, we see this. Abraham fathered Isaac. And then what's it say? Isaac fathered Jacob. And then read on. And Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Now, who are these brothers of Judah? Well, if you go back to the book of Genesis you'll find their names. You don't have to turn back there. I'm going to give you their names. Twelve brothers of Judah, or eleven brothers. Judah was the twelfth. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, Isaac, or Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Joseph, two sons out of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and Benjamin. Now, these names actually become the twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes of Israel that go into bondage in Egypt for 400 years. Until finally Moses comes along and leads them out of slavery into a promised land, the actual land that God promised Abraham to give him. And today, friends, if you go to Israel and step in that land, what you will find are millions 
of Jewish people living in that land that God promised Abraham. So today, when you travel to the Holy Land, you actually see the fulfillment of the covenant before your very eyes. Abraham has an offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky living in this place. And so we see Abraham, but secondly, we see David. Now, you know David. David, of course, is the same David that we read about who fought the giant named Goliath. This David is the same David that you know is King David who actually runs away from King Saul because he's being chased and he never lays his hand on God's anointed. He's the David who showed the, the, the grace to the crippled boy Mephibosheth and he's the David who sinned and uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband. David has some of the most intriguing stories in the Old Testament, but once again, Brother Mac, if we're not careful, we can actually skip over the most important part. And the most important part, Russell, is that God enters into a covenant relationship with David as well. So to Abraham, he promises offspring, and to Abraham, he promises a land, but to David, he promises a royal throne that will stand for all of eternity. Now, how is all this tied in? Well, it's all tied in back in the book of Genesis. So you remember Jacob, and you remember that Jacob had Judah and his brothers. Well, his 12 brothers, the fourthborn's name was Judah. And Judah is a very interesting character. You can go back and read about him in, in the book of Genesis. But Jacob, as he is dying, gives a blessing to all of his children. And in giving a blessing to all of his children, he actually says these words to Judah. He says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the necks of your enemies and your father's sons will bow down to you. Judah is a young lion. My son, you return from the kill. He crouches, he lies down like a lion or a lioness who dare, dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until whose right it is comes and the obedience of the peoples belong to him. And so Jacob at this moment in the book of Genesis is actually putting the right of kingship on top of his fourthborn son, Judah. And it's significant because at this moment, God is actually the God or the king of the Jewish people. And so Judah or Jacob here is actually prophesying in the future that there's going to be a moment in time where the Israelites say, God, we don't want you to be our king anymore. Give us a king like the rulers of the earth. And we know this comes to pass in the book of 1 Samuel with King Saul. In 1 Samuel, they say, God, we don't want you to be our king anymore. We want a king like everybody else. And they, they put Saul as the king. But Saul can never be the king because Jacob did not bless the tribe of Benjamin. Jacob blessed the tribe of Judah. And so Saul sins and Saul fails. And then what does God do? He tells Samuel, go down to Jesse's house in Bethlehem and anoint a son to be the king. And friends, when he goes down to Jesse's house, understand that Jesse's of the tribe of Judah. And who does he find? He finds David. David who was one after God's own heart. And with David, God gives another covenant. If you'll go back with me now to the book of 2 Samuel chapter number 7. The book of 2 Samuel chapter number 7. You'll find this covenant that God gives to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 beginning in verse 8. Remember a covenant is a binding agreement that cannot be broken. Now this is what you are to say to my servant David. This is what the Lord of hosts says. I took you from the pasture and from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. I will make a name for you like that of the greatest in the land and I will establish a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may live there and not be disturbed again. Evil doers will not afflict them as they have done ever since the day I ordered judges to be over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. And then listen to this. The Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. It's interesting to hear that because David has actually just told God he desires to build a house for him that he could, his spirit can dwell in. But here God says, no, no, no. You're not going to make a house for me, David. I'm actually going to make a house for you. And when your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. And he will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
And I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And when he does wrong, I will discipline him with a human rod and with blows from the others. But my faithful love will never leave him, leave him as I removed it from Saul, and I removed, it, uh, removed him from your way. Now listen to this. you got to understand that, that the last little bit there is, is God speaking about Solomon. But here in verse 16, here's the covenant. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. And so what is God saying to David? David, from your lineage is going to come the king of Israel. Not just the king of Israel in the flesh, but the king of Israel that will stand forever. You see, Abraham has been chosen, and out of Abraham has now come David. And David, I'm going to bring forth a king that is going to be the Messiah and the Savior of the people. And what happens from that point forward, you can trace it from 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, buddy. What happens from that moment forward is Satan comes in and does everything he can to destroy the royal line of David. He comes in with one mission. If I can destroy the royal line of David with sin, with immorality, with wickedness and idolatry, I can make God so angry that he will break his covenant blessings with his people. And the people will cease to have a person from the line of David sitting on the throne. And by doing so, I can stop the Messiah from coming. And so what you see down through this lineage of Matthew, starting in verse 6 all the way down through verse 11, is one evil king after another until finally we get down to Jeconiah. And with Jeconiah comes a time of sin unlike has ever been seen in the Jewish land. And what happens is God finally says through the prophet Jeremiah, verse 22 and 30 of Jeremiah, this is what the Lord says, record this man as a childless man who will not be successful in his lifetime and none of his descendants will succeed in sitting on the throne of David or ruling in Judah again. So finally it comes to a point where God says because of the sins of Jeconiah, never again will anyone from this lineage sit on the throne of Judah. And no longer will they sit on the throne of Israel. I'm cutting the line off. Now imagine being a Jewish individual. And the Bible says what next? It says at this time becomes the exile to Babylon. And so immediately upon God cutting off Jeconiah and the house of David, what happens? The nation of Israel goes into Babylon and there are 400 years of silence. God doesn't speak. God doesn't stir. And for 400 years, these people are, sit, are sitting and thinking that God has gotten so angry with them that he has completely cut off the line of David. There is no hope. There is no redemption. There is no Savior coming. It's interesting to note here that when you read the Jewish Old Testament not the Old Testament that we hold in our hands, but the Old Testament that the Jews hold in their hands. It actually ends with First and Second Chronicles, not Malachi. And you remember that in First and Second Chronicles, the first nine chapters of First Chronicles, maybe even the first eleven chapters, are nothing but a list of names. Why does Ezra record all those names in Chronicles? It's because he's wanting the Jewish people to know: remember who you are, and understand this: that God has not forgotten you in exile. There is coming a time, there is coming a day where God will remember his covenant blessings. And so imagine being a Jewish person in exile. You've been there for 400 years. Uh, your, your fathers, your grandfathers, they've all waited in exile. They've all heard that God has cut off the line of David, cut off the line of Jeconiah. You've got First Chronicles in your hands. You read the first 10 chapters and it cuts off. And then suddenly somebody puts a... A, a book in your hand and it, it reads like this, the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And suddenly upon reading just that first verse as a Jewish individual, hope springs into your heart. Maybe God has not forgotten us. Can it be that this Jesus is actually the Messiah, the Savior of the world? But how can it be? Because He's of the line of Jeconiah. And Jeremiah said that no one from this line would ever sit on the throne of, of David again. So how can Jesus be the one? Well, friends, this is where you insert Luke chapter number three. Because 
In Matthew chapter 1, what we have is Jesus' line coming through Solomon. And this is the royal line that was sitting on the throne, the one that was exceedingly evil, the one that Satan was trying to destroy. But what Satan didn't see was another line that was coming behind the scenes. You see, David and Bathsheba, the Bible tells us in Luke 3, David and Bathsheba had a second son, and his name was Nathan. And of Nathan's line, we do not read of sin, we do not read of immorality, we do not read of wickedness, and we certainly do not read of idolatry. And so while Satan's busy destroying the line of David through Solomon, God is busy raising up the line through Nathan, which would be the line of Mary, which would be the one who would bring forth Jesus. And so imagine being a Jewish person reading these lineages of Jesus and what happens now is hope begins to spring up in your life that God has actually remembered us despite our sin. And so when we see Matthew 1 and Luke 3, we notice that God remembers his covenant blessings and his promises to his people. And friends, it's good news for us tonight because God, Miss Angie, gives us three or 30,000 promises in his word. 30,000. And if God will remember the promises to his covenant people, how much more will he remember his promises to us, his children, through the blood of his son, Jesus? Oh, aren't you glad for the promises of God tonight? Amen. That God remembers them. Secondly, the genealogy of Jesus actually points us to the hope of the gospel. Now turn back with me to Luke chapter 3. If you're probably still there, but Luke chapter 3. The genealogy of Luke actually goes a little bit different than Matthew. You see, Matthew gives us the genealogy of Jesus through his stepfather Joseph. Luke gives us the genealogy of Jesus through his mother, Mary. Matthew traces the line of Jesus back to Abraham. Luke traces the line of Jesus all the way back to Adam. Now what Luke does is really interesting. Luke actually starts with Jesus and ends with Adam, where most of the time the genealogical records would read the other way. It would start with Adam and end with Jesus. But what Luke is wanting us to do is, is point us to something. And it's, and, it's, and it's if you read it backwards that you actually find it. So when you read it backwards, what you find is the lineage from the first Adam to the second Adam. Or if you look there in verse 38, it says, son of Adam, son of God. What you see reading it backwards is the lineage of Adam, the son of God, to Jesus, God, the son. And so this lineage is actually beginning now to point us to the hope of the gospel. How does it do this? Well, it does this by reading the names up to Noah. Now just read these names with me, starting in verse 38 backwards. Adam, whose son was Seth, whose son was Enosh, whose son was Kenan, whose son was Mahalalel, whose son was Jared, whose son was Enoch, whose son was Methuselah, whose son was Lamech, whose son was Noah. You see all the names there listed on your screen. Now, if you follow back with me to the book of Genesis, chapter number five, book of Genesis, chapter number five, you're going you're gonna to see all these names listed. And the reason I want you to turn back there is I just want you to see, first of all, that Luke did not leave out any names from this lineage. So you look down through here and you'll find all these names again. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Now, once again, you read these names, Rick, and you might just skim over them and think it's no big deal. But, but I want to show you something here to show you how the lineage of the genealogical records actually point us to the hope of the gospel. So watch this. I'm going to about to show you the meaning of these names. So we'll go on to the next screen. Adam means man. All right? So Adam means man. After Adam, we have Seth. That means appointed. After Seth, we have Kenan. And Kenan actually means sorrow. I missed him on the screen. But Kenan actually means sorrow. Next, or excuse me, no, Enos means mortal. Next would be Kenan. Kenan means sorrow. So I missed Enos in my notes. So Enos means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalel means the blessed one. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means the despairing. 
and Noah means rest. And so if you read the genealogical records of, of, of Genesis chapter 5, you don't read them as names, but you read them as meaning of names. What you actually find is a sentence. And here's the sentence. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring to despair and rest. The meanings of the names in order actually is a sentence that points us to what? The blessed God that shall come down. And who's the blessed God that shall come down? Luke traces the royal thread all the way back to the supposed son of Joseph named Jesus. And so what we see here once again is that the genealogical records of Jesus actually point us to the hope of the gospel. Friends, you cannot tell me that some Jewish writers some 4,000 years ago or a man named Moses 4,000 years ago could just make names up that would equal a sentence. It points us to the hope of the gospel. But I want you to see what Matthew does. Now go back to Matthew chapter 1. Now what Matthew does immediately upon reading Matthew, something jumps off, off the page, Marie. And it's the list or the names of a group of women. So when you come to Matthew 1, there are actually five women who were listed. Now this is very interesting that Matthew would list women. And here's why. Now listen to this whole train of thought and you'll hear why. To a Jew, it's vitally important that they have to be clean and to be purified before entering into the temple. And so a Jew will purify themselves. They'll walk down the street going to the temple. If they touch anything unclean on the way, they have to stop and wash again before entering the temple. So here's a Jew. He's walking down the street. He bumps into a Gentile. What does he do? He actually does not go wash if he bumps into a Gentile. Because to a Jew, a Gentile doesn't even exist. A Gentile is considered invisible to the Jews, as if they don't even walk on the face of the earth. Now listen to this. A Jewish man, when he prays, actually prays and says, God, I'm glad you didn't make me a Gentile or a woman. And so a woman to a Jewish man is equivalent to a Gentile, which means to Gentile men, women don't even exist. And so here is Matthew, a Jewish man, including a list of female names in the genealogical records of Jesus. It's kind of amazing, kind of startling, but why does he do this? Well, Matthew, you've got to remember, is a Jew, and so Matthew was well-schooled in the creation. And you remember in the creation, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, what? They fall, and upon falling, God curses Adam, Eve, and the serpent. Now, when cursing the serpent, God says these words. He says, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. And you will move on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will strike or he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The first thing I want you to notice about that statement of God is the finality of this battle. And so God is pointing to a time where the serpent is actually going to strike the heel of the seed of the woman. But in striking the heel of the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman is actually going to crush his head. Why is that important? Well, friends, it's important to note because the serpent can only be killed when what? You crush his head. I remember as a little boy, my grandfather Downs, he used to pay his $5 a snake to go snake hunting on the golf course. And so me and my brother, we're like eight years old. We take our pellet guns and we go hunt snakes. Looking back at it, it's a pretty stupid move. I, I, maybe he was just trying to, to off us. I don't know. But we'd go out there and we'd kill copperheads and we'd kill these animals, these snakes. And I can remember one time bringing these snakes back to my house and they were in a cardboard box. And me and my brother, we'd shot them all, but we'd not cut their, cut their heads off. And so I remember my daddy standing beside me. I said, look at this snake. And I reached down and I touched his head. Right, which I would never do today, by the way. And I reached out, and right as I'm about to touch his head, my daddy swats me, and he says, what are you, crazy? He says, a snake is never dead unless you cut his head off. And so when God says in Genesis 3, you're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head, understand that God is saying when you strike him, he is going to give you a, a fatal blow that you will never return from. 
So what is he pointing to? He's pointing to the cross. There's going to be a moment where you strike the Messiah, the seed of the woman, but in striking him, he is going to crush you forever. How does he crush you? Well, first of all, he dies for the sins of the world, but then he defeats death, the penalty of sin, by rising forth from the dead. And so Genesis 3.15, we have the finality of this battle between God and Satan, but it's through the seed of the woman. Now, friends, that's very significant. Why? Because, I'm not trying to get graphic here, but just, just, just listen to this. When you think about conception, the seed never comes from the woman. The seed always comes from the man. The man gives the seed, the woman gives the egg. The man will never give the egg and the woman will never give the seed, despite what North Carolina tries to tell you, right? Some of y'all catch up to that in a little bit when you get home and see all the fight about HB2. But anyway, the seed is always from the father. And understand that a child in the womb of the mother does not receive its blood from the mama. The child in the womb receives the blood from its father. And so when we look at Genesis 3 and it says the seed of the woman, God is saying here that the woman is actually going to bring forth a son that is not touched by the seed of the man. Because if this one is touched by the seed of the man, he will receive the blood of Adam. And by receiving the blood of Adam, he will receive a sin nature. And so in Genesis 3, what God is actually doing is pointing us toward a virgin birth. There's going to come a time where the woman is going to miraculously conceive a son in her own body without the touch of a man. And that son is going to crush the head of the serpent. Now, why is that so important? It's important because when you come back to Matthew, you read all the way down and you start to hit these women. Matthew being a Jew, Russell, what he's trying to say is, look, you come down and you see Judah, who Jacob said is going to have the kingship, the royal line. But remember, he had two sons, Perez and Zerah, but neither one of them can be the seed of the woman. Why? Because they're tainted by Judah. And then you come on down and you have Boaz, who is brought forth by Rahab. And Boaz, even though he's like our kinsman redeemer, cannot be our kinsman redeemer. Why? Because his daddy's Salmon. And then we have Obed. And even though Obed is the grandfather of David, he also cannot be the one we're looking for. Why? Because Boaz is his daddy. And then we've got Solomon, but Solomon also can't be the Messiah. Why? Because his mama Uriah committed adultery with David. And once again, he's touched by the seed of the man. But, but, but what about Mary? Verse 16, Jacob fathered Joseph. And listen to the change in language. The husband of Mary who gave birth to Jesus. Not Joseph, the father of Jesus, but the husband of Mary who gave birth to Jesus, who's called the Messiah. Do you see it? There's a change. Joseph is not... Jesus' father. Instead, he comes from a different place. And how does that happen? Go back with me to Luke chapter 1. I'll just read it to you because it's just so beautiful to read. Or Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin, a virgin, the seed of the woman, to a virgin named Joseph, uh, or, or to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. The angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor. And I learned this last week in Sunday school. The word favor there is actually the word charis, which is the word grace. And so what it actually says is, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace with God. What's that let us know? It's nothing about Mary. Mary is just a sinful woman just like everybody else. And so the only reason she is able to carry the Son of God is because of the grace of God shown forth in her life. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. And then Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I've not been intimate with a man? And the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High uh, will, will overshadow you and therefore the Holy One to be born of you will be called the Son of God. 
Mary was a virgin. Friends, listen to me. It's vitally, vitally important to understand that a virgin conceived. Some think that's not important, but friends, it's essential to the gospel. Why? One young man put it like this earlier in the week. The empty tomb does not matter without a sinless life. And a sinless life is not possible without a virgin birth. The, gene the genealogical records of Jesus actually point us to the hope of the gospel. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching the despairing or, or giving the teaching the despairing to have rest. The seed of the woman, the virgin, will conceive and bring forth a son. And this son will die for the sins of his people. And in dying for the sins of his people will crush the head of the serpent by being raised from the dead. Friends, it's the hope of the gospel. But third tonight, and then we'll close, I want you to see this. The genealogy of Jesus reminds us that although our past may be checkered, God can do a mighty work in us. The genealogy of Jesus reminds us that although our past may be checkered, God can do a mighty work in us. We have just talked about the hope of the gospel. What is the hope of the gospel, Rick? The hope of the gospel is salvation through Christ alone. So let me find you, show you this principle in Scripture. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. Here the Bible says, When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption, underline that word adoption, as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Salvation, adoption. What's it say? When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of the woman, under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption. To redeem those as salvation. Friends, when you were saved, you experienced salvation. But then a wonderful thing happens, Russell. Adoption. And I, I heard a preacher tell it this way this week. And, and I, I just, upon hearing this and, and looking at these verses, I, I just have to share it with you because I think that he nailed it on the head. So just imagine that my daddy tells me tonight to go down to the penitentiary in Columbia to walk into the door and to look at the warden and say, Sir, I want you to point me in the direction of the most heinous, vile criminal you have in this place. And so the warden does exactly that. He says, Okay, he's down in this cell and you can find him down there. And so I walk down through there and I get to his cell block and I, I knock on his little window and he comes to the window, he opens the window and I says, Sir, I'm here to give you the greatest offer you've ever had. He says, well, what's the offer? And I say, well, I've come to serve your sentence for you. And the man in the cell looks back at me and says, what do you mean you've come to serve my sentence for me? Why would you do something like that? I said, well, my daddy told me to come down here to find the most heinous criminal and to serve his sentence for him. So the man looks back at me and says, well, sir, you do know that I'm serving the death penalty. And if you serve my sentence for me, you will never get out of this place. And I say, look, man, I know you're serving the death penalty. But because I obey my father and want to honor him, I'm going to serve the death penalty for you. Will you receive the offer? And so the man in the jail cell says, well, I don't completely understand it. But sure, yes, I'll take the offer because I've been wanting out of here for some time. And so I open the cell block and he steps out and I step in and I shut the gate behind me. He's walking away and I'm holding on to the bars and I, I shout at him and I say, sir, come back. You see, as I release him out of that death penalty, that's salvation. I'm serving his sentence for him. But now I call him back and say, come back, sir. And he walks back and he comes to the cell. He says, did you rethink it? 
I say, no, 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 I haven't rethought it. I actually want to give you an even better offer. And he says, well, how can it be any better than it already is? I say, well, sir, please understand that, that my daddy told me that when I step into this cell and lock the gate behind me, he actually wants me to give you his address. Because he wants you to leave this place and to come to his house. And when you get there, he's got adoption papers for you. And so he's going to make you his own son. And he's going to let you sleep in my bed. And he's going to let you eat at my table. And he's going to let you receive my inheritance. And the man steps back and says, how can this be? You mean to tell me your father's going to adopt me? Does he know who I am? He says, sir. I say, sir, he knows exactly who you are. But he wants to adopt you as his own. That's Galatians. You see, Jesus has come to provide salvation for us, to redeem us, but not only to redeem us, but to actually tell us, go to my father because he's going to adopt you as his own and the inheritance that is due unto me, I'm giving unto you so that you can share in glory with me. It's a beautiful principle that by the death of Jesus, we can actually be adopted as sons of of God. You tonight can be a part of the family of God. Isn't that a beautiful thing, friend? Amen. And it's what we learn in, in the genealogies. And listen, if Jesus can list every name of G, or excuse me, if God can list every name of Jesus' physical line, how much more does he remember the names of those born by the Spirit? You see, this is what I believe the genealogies teach us. God loves to record names in his book. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life etched in heaven? It can be. You say, well, Zach, you don't know what I've done. Well, friends, I want to invite you to go back with me quickly back to the Gospel of Matthew. And just look at these names because as you read these names, what you will find are some pretty checkered individuals. Sure, you see names like Abraham, but I've already told you that Abraham slept with a slave in order to bring forth his own son that he thought would be the one God would bless. Jacob, do I have to tell you about how Jacob swindled and cheated his brothers and his daddy in order to get the blessing? What about Judah? You see the name Tamar. Judah actually did not allow Tamar to marry his youngest son after his two oldest boys had died. And so Tamar dresses up, dresses up like a prostitute and Judah buys her and sleeps with her and brings forth two sons by his own daughter-in-law. Perez fathered his Ron, his Ron fathered a Ram, a Ram fathered a Minadab, Minadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. You remember Rahab, don't you? She's the prostitute that lived down in Jericho. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. You remember Ruth, don't you? The old Moabite who was an unclean individual living off in a distant land, but here she is in the genealogical records of Jesus. Obed fathered Jesse, Jesse fathered King David. Do I have to tell you about David? David was a great man to begin with, but then what does he do? He sleeps with his friend's wife, and then he murders his friend, and his family is torn apart all because of his sin. Then there's Solomon who brought idols into the country and married a thousand women and led the nation of Israel into idolatry. And then there's Rehoboam, and you can start going down here. Rehoboam was influenced by idols. Abijah walked in the sins of his father. Asa was a good king, but Jehoshaphat made an alliance with the wicked king. Jehoram walked in the way of the kings of the Israels, the house of Ahab had done. He, he did evil in the Lord's sight. Uzziah did right, but didn't tear down the high places. Joseph, Jotham, like his father, did what was right, but allowed idolatry to continue. Ahaz, you just go so on and so on and so on. You read these names and what you start to find, there's some pretty checkered individuals in the line of Jesus. And yet, Justin, it's this line that God sovereignly chose before the foundations of the world to bring forth the Messiah. Why would God do that? It's to let you know that, friends, no matter how bad you've been, God can do a mighty work in your life. He can reach down into your heart and take the most checkered, the most vile individual, and he can make you a son, a daughter of God. Isn't that wonderful? And the Bible teaches us that no matter how messed up you may be, no matter how checkered your past may look, God can do a mighty work in you by the work of Jesus, who took our sin on himself, died the death we deserve, but overcame the grave. Oh, what a joy it is to know tonight 
that our sins can be forgiven. We find all of this in a list of names. That God remembers his promises. That there is hope in the gospel. And that God can do a mighty work in you no matter how bad you've been. I'm reading through this book and you get toward the end of this book and my grandfather McDowell, who is my grandmother's father, in the year 1923 started writing a Christmas journal. And every year he would add to this from 1923 up to 1970, he kept a journal about every single Christmas that they shared in their house. So as I'm reading these things the other day, I come to this little book in the back, and it's all in here, and I said, now we'll read through this. And I come to the year 1936, and I want you to hear this. I think it's a perfect way to finish tonight's message. Christmas of 1936, a joyful time. Another stocking to be hung this year. Mary Lee was born in February, and there's plenty of ice and snow. Now she's a plump little girl. I would never say that about June. <laughs> now she's a plump little girl waiting for Christmas with the others. So with all the joy and excitement of the holidays, we prepare for Christmas. The Christmas chandelier is hung. The tree is decorated. And all those good smells coming from the kitchen as cakes are cooked and other things are prepared by Mom for us to enjoy. It seems Mom and Pop have been whispering a lot for something. Then old Chris Mell of fruit begins to fill the house. The children can hardly wait for the time to shoot the fireworks. But at last, the boys and girls are lighting sparklers and firecrackers, then the skyrockets, then back to a warm fire and ready for bed. <coughs> old Santa came, and next morning, what a time, toys, fruits, and children everywhere. So comes the close of another holiday. The snow is gently falling, making the ground, the trees, and the shrubs a beautiful white. The world has been transformed into a wonderland, peaceful, clean, and unblemished, so it seems, reminding us of the words of Jesus when he said, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be like crimson, I will make them white like snow. Though they be like scarlet, I will make them like wool. When everything is covered with snow, it looks so clean, so pure, even dirty places are hid. The blood of Jesus can do the same thing for the lives of men. Amen. Father, we have come through a list of names tonight. You know my heart. These names teach us so much. And God, oftentimes we just jump right over. We forget that even in the names, that they have been inspired by the Holy Spirit and there's a message for us. A message that we need to hear. And this very last point, God reminds us that although we may have past that are checkered, that are ugly and vile. But just like my old Paul Paul McDowell said in 1936, some 80 years ago, though your sins be like scarlet, they can be whiter than snow by the blood of Jesus. Lord, I'm thankful tonight for these names because they teach us in Jesus and in Jesus alone the salvation possible. And so tonight, God, I'm going to pray that those in the room that don't know you, that tonight might be the night of salvation. Lord, as I look around, I know most of the people who are here. Most of the people who are here, God, if, if the rapture came today, I know that they would spend eternity with you. Death came unexpectedly. Lord, I could stand before a congregation of people and I could say that person was a, a born of God believer in Jesus Christ. And so God, tonight I pray this has just been a reminder to them of the, of, of, the, of the Savior that they have, who he is, what he represents, how he was born, when he came, the people he came to save. But God, there may be one, two, maybe eight, maybe ten that never have known you as their Savior. And tonight, God, they want to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to pray that, God, even in this moment, that you might move in their hearts, that they might give their lives to you in salvation and faith. Lord, we praise your holy name, and we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand at this time, we are going to have a time of invitation. You go ahead and hit play.